So Mark chapter 14. So we find our way here through this chapter. Last time we were here in chapter 14, we seen here Jesus betrayed by Judas Iscariot. And the statement that Jesus had made was no surprise. As a matter of fact, uh, Jesus had told all the disciples, including Judas Iscariot and all those that were within earshot of Jesus' words, that all of the disciples will be made to stumble because of Jesus. Uh, Jesus even goes on to say that this would be something that would happen as soon as the evening in which they were partaking of the meal. Jesus said this night. And Jesus then reaffirms this with a passage in the Old Testament. The passage is taken from the book of the prophet Zechariah in chapter 13. And the Bible says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So the point that Jesus is making is that they will stumble because of what Scripture says. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And then Peter's response is this. He said to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. In other words, we looked at this in detail in Jesus' betrayal with Judas Iscariot because Judas had already agreed at the start of chapter 10, or excuse me, uh, chapter 14 and verse 10, to, to betray Jesus. He had agreed to a certain amount. Um, Judas was never a believer. Now, I know people try to argue this as much as they would like to argue this, but remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 24. Jesus said, the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Now remember that the statement that Jesus is, is meaning, or the statement that's being made, the meaning behind it is that there is consequence to this betrayal. And ultimately, whether it was Judas or anybody else for that matter, when he's saying this man, he's not saying Judas specifically, He's saying the individual that betrays in this manner would be better for that person to have not been born. He wasn't saying that it was not better for Judas to have not been born, but ultimately because what follows. Judas never repented of his betraying of Jesus. And you can see the contrast between Judas selling Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and the contrast of Peter denying Jesus at the end of both accounts, Judas tried to distance himself because he felt shame. Whereas Peter wept bitterly, ultimately he showed signs of repentance. Judas, rather than repenting, felt by killing himself that was the best way out. And when Jesus said it better, it had been better for this man to have not have been born. He was talking about the judgment eternally that would come. So the clear, excuse me, the clear indication there is that Judas did not end up in a good place. Not because of the manner in which he killed himself, the fact that, or the manner in which he died by killing himself, the fact that Judas did not repent. And um, ultimately, Judas was not a believer. And what we see here is in this statement alone is the clear picture of the sovereignty of God um, with the Lord knowing all things, but we also see the will of man working together with the sovereignty of God. So God had from ages past determined that Christ would be betrayed. He would be betrayed by Judas, that Jesus would also die on the cross for our sins, that Jesus would also be resurrected from the dead. These are not things that just started to come about as they happen. These were things that God sovereignly purposed, and this is the plan of God. So this is why Jesus said, he said he would go just as it is written about him. 
Nothing would stop the plan of God to provide salvation for mankind. And, and even in this statement alone, when Peter you know, said to him, even, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Well, ultimately what Peter is saying, though we see the fidelity of Peter here, his desire is to follow Jesus wherever, even if it means that you know, he would die. But though that's great and all, remember, zeal should never supersede what God's word says. And I think a lot of times this is where we learn a lot. You miss a lot when you're overzealous because at times there are people that support zeal rather than the word. What Jesus is reaffirming here in the statement of, of this denial uh, with that all would, would be made to stumble and ultimately Peter would deny him, this is all a part of God's sovereign plan. So to say otherwise is to speak against the sovereign plan of God. Jesus then reaffirms and he says, this is not just a good idea. Jesus says, this is what has been spoken of in the scriptures. So no matter what, Jesus would have been betrayed by one of those who followed from the 12 of the disciples of Jesus. And then we also see, too, that Jesus is saying all will be made to stumble because the scriptures say so. For Peter to say they might, but I will not, was ultimately Peter saying, Jesus, you're not being truthful. And then Jesus responds in verse 30 with assuredly I, and I believe I shared this with you guys last time, some translations will say verily, some translations will say truthfully, assuredly, verily, or truthfully actually means truthfully. And what Jesus is saying, no, Peter, this is truth. This is truth. I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you, Peter, will deny me three times. Now, what's interesting here is I would say that perhaps maybe even the disciples still may be in a sense confused. Because remember, they all asked, is it I, is it I, when, when Jesus said that in verse 18 of chapter 14, assuredly I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say to him, one by one, is it I? Maybe that's what stirred Peter's heart to say, I won't, you know, stumble because of you. Maybe to, in a sense, in his own passion and his own zeal to say, I know it's not me who's going to betray you. We often, and if that is the case, we often have a sense in our flesh to make claims about our lives as Christians that are not truthful. That is a reality. The truth of the matter is that what God's word says is truth. You can't escape from that. Now, it's not taking your interpretation because in essence, notice that Peter responds after Jesus gives the word. So there's two things happening here. Jesus, Jesus quotes Zechariah 13, and he says, this is why, because this is what the word says. One of two things is happening. Peter's zeal is superseding what the word of God says, or Peter, like a lot of people, even here at this church, say, well, this is what I think the verse is saying. So Peter could have easily just dismissed the passage because of his zeal. I will never do that. So in essence, the verse doesn't apply to me, or that's not really what the verse means. But Scripture interprets Scripture. Jesus is the fulfillment of it. And in a sense, you can see that from Peter, of all people who would make this claim, in a sense, you could say, well, maybe this is why, because he was desiring to not ever fail Jesus. That is a good point. But the fact that Judas Iscariot would betray Jesus brought great sorrow to the disciples. Now, I want you guys to understand one thing in all of this. Out of those that went out, as Jesus sent out the 70, as Jesus, uh, you know, uh, did much with the disciples, right? He, he had the three who Peter, James, and John, who were his the faithful out of the three, these were the ones that spent the most time with Jesus, Peter being one of them. 
And then you have the 12. And, you know, from the 12, the three are always mentioned, Peter, James, and John. But then the others. The other nine disciples, Judas was one of those disciples. Now, oftentimes people say because, you know, that when Jesus sent out the 70 and they came back with these praise reports, Jesus says, you know, now your names will be written in heaven, you know, in that regard. In other words, recognition. I think that has a lot to do with the binding and loosing. Because at this point, I don't believe the disciples were born again. And I can argue that from John's gospel in chapter 20, when Jesus said to the disciples, receive the Holy Spirit. Prior to that, they had yet to receive him. I believe that's where the disciples became born again. They didn't need to respond in that way because prior to that, Jesus was with them. He was there. This is how they were able to go and perform miracles in Jesus' absence, and they came back with this praise report. How were they able to perform miracles if the Holy Spirit hadn't even come down yet, like in Acts chapter 2? Because Christ was here on this earth. And it wasn't until after his resurrection that he tells them, now receive the Holy Spirit. That is fitting for all have to come through the same means, even the disciples of Jesus. They have to believe who he is. So the idea that I think is important here is that Judas Iscariot, Jesus said in John chapter 17 in verse 12, Jesus prays concerning his disciples. And notice what Jesus says. He says, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Judas never called Jesus Lord. He always called him rabbi. And Jesus also said concerning Judas that he was greedy, that Jesus knew things about Judas, his heart. He exposed him. He said that he was also taking from the money box, right? So Judas, even though he was among the 12, he was stealing and he was greedy. And remember, it was Judas out of the 12 that said that costly ointment that was poured on him in his anointing before his death, it was Judas who said, why did we waste this? So he felt that that costly oil was a waste. If Jesus would have been his savior, if Jesus would have been his Lord, if Jesus would have been his Messiah, he would have never uttered those words of waste. But because Jesus wasn't, he didn't see even a fine, costly jar of ointment was worthy. So we see the value that he had in Jesus. He really placed no value in Jesus. And this is why when it was further reaffirmed, when he agreed to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a gourd slave or to replace a slave. I'll take 30 pieces of silver for him. He just said he, he's not worth this, you know, oil of anointing. And he's not worth more than a gourd slave or a replaced slave. So I think this further then confirms what we see here. So what we see in Luke chapter 9 in verses 1 through 6, when Judas is included in this group that proclaimed the gospel and performed miracles. Here's one thing we can take from this. Judas had faith, but it was not a true saving faith. Judas was never saved, but for a time he was a follower of Christ. This should really, really remind us and stir our hearts because Jesus even said the same thing. Jesus said in Matthew 7, not everybody who calls upon my name, Lord, Lord. He even talks about miracles being performed in his name, prophecies, all of these things. He says, they're not going to make heaven their home. So Jesus is saying that the same type of individuals can be a part of the body of Christ today. Now, the beauty of it is that if there are those in the church, which there are, or perhaps those that have not come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, 
The beauty of today is there's still hope. That's why messages like this have to be preached and taught so that others can sit there and really ponder what is the purpose of God's will for my life? What am I doing? Am I yielded? Am I submitted to it? Or am I just dancing around it? Do I not see it as something that should be important for that matter? And so we see here, Peter, on the other hand, had faith in Jesus. Peter even demonstrated a greater faith than all of the other disciples. Maybe this is another reason why we see Peter here responding in this way. But ultimately, all of this we see that Judas betrays Jesus. Peter will deny Jesus. And then as Jesus goes to the, you know, pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus there is betrayed, we see at the close of this encounter in verses 51 and 52, scriptures fulfilled, Judas betrays Jesus, Jesus is arrested, the disciples scatter. According to Matthew's gospel, Peter tries to respond to Jesus' arrest by cutting the ear off one of the servants of the high priest. And then what does Jesus do? He heals that servant. And yet, verse 51 and 52, in a sense, this is kind of like reaffirming what Jesus said, that all would be made to stumble. Now, a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body, and the young man laid hold of him. In other words, this is none other than the author of Mark's gospel, John Mark. And John Mark here is apprehended, perhaps because of the commotion. It's believed, some believe here as they kind of read the text in the story here, why the detail here? Well, one, because he is the author. But two, it shows that, you know, this place of where the upper room is, uh, where they were gathering, where they were meeting, most likely could have been at, you know, uh, John Mark's uh, mother's home. And ultimately, we see here that the Garden of Gethsemane was not too far from this. The commotion, it was, it was in a sense, it stirred him. Perhaps, you know, he's not going to be in a linen cloth thrown around his naked body at night out there. Nobody does that. The, the cloth here that it's speaking about is consistent with, um, you know, pajamas that you would wear to go to bed. So it's obvious that he came from a place where perhaps he heard the commotion. Maybe someone told him, hey, they're arresting this Jesus that you guys just had a meal with. Whatever the case was, he fled. It just shows the urgency. And it shows here as he fled there, they apprehended him. They grabbed him. And of course they would. They just had one of Jesus' disciples chop the ear off one of the servants of the priest. And it says here that John Mark says he fled and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now, this does not mean that, you know, he was physically naked, meaning what? That this linen cloth that would cover him as pajamas, let's just use it in that term, uh, was left in their hands and, and, and he fled probably with just underclothes on. That's the picture here. So in other words, all fell away just as Jesus said they would. They fell away, but Jesus fulfilled his calling. Jesus remained in the place where he said he would be. He had said on more than one occasion, three times to be exact, that he would be delivered up, that he would be arrested. And in verse 53, it says, they led Jesus away to the high priest and with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest and he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Can you imagine the servants, you know, of the priest thinking this is the guy that chopped our buddy's ear off. But in this next part here, we see that, you know, Jesus is arrested, taken like he said he would be. He was led away to the high priest. According to John's gospel in chapter 18, what do we see here? We see that Jesus was taken before uh, Annas 
in John chapter 18 and verse 12. And, and this was his trial really was before the religious men of Israel, the Jewish religious authorities, if you will. And this preliminary hearing by Annas was important. Now remember that Annas was not the high priest. His son-in-law actually was. And you guys know him by Caiaphas. Most Bible scholars know him as the high priest Joseph Caiaphas. And John's gospel says that the reason, I would say, when John's gospel says that he was taken to Annas, this was Caiaphas' father-in-law because Annas was expelled as high priest by the Romans. But he still had much respect and authority among the Jews. So this preliminary hearing that he has, he's, he's taken to him there. And then we also see that there is an arrangement now for him to go before Caiaphas. And this is where we are right here in verse 53. So he already stands before Annas, and now he's before Caiaphas, the high priest, and also the Sanhedrin, and this is at night. Now, some have speculated that, uh, you know, this whole kangaroo court, and it was, but, but some have speculated there is so much violation of Jewish law here. But in essence, I would say that this was more of a push to get Jesus to trial quickly and condemn to death before Shabbat because that was their aim, because they could not do anything during that high holy day. They would have to wait a lot longer. And if they did anything after Shabbat, this would most likely, what was one of their fears? That if they apprehended Jesus, even apprehending him would cause an uproar with the crowds. Now remember, this was during the Feast of Passover. And according to the Jewish historian Josephus, well, he says close to 250,000 sheep were sacrificed during this entire feast time over a period of several days, right? And these sheep were brought. And remember, on the 10th day of Nisan, they were to bring it into their home. They were to prepare it, and they were to identify if there was any spots or blemishes. They are following the order there of Exodus chapter 12, the Passover that the Lord instituted, which brought the people out of Egypt. So they're celebrating a high time. And, and many from all over, the Jews from all over the region of Israel and beyond are coming to gather there for this day. So it is a time in which there are more people there than usual. Now, if uh, the Jewish historian Josephus is correct, 250,000 sheep being offered up on Passover would then imply that there was probably 2.5 million people there just in that moment. So you could imagine, they've already considered him a prophet. Remember, the people marveled at the things Jesus said, the miracles he performed. Many of the people in the crowd benefited from Jesus' ministry. So this would, this would cause an uproar. And remember, you know, the people of Israel, the high priest, well, they were not in charge. Rome was. This is how Jesus makes his way to Pontius Pilate because Pontius Pilate is actually over Judea. He's over that area of Israel. And he kind of just makes sure that, you know, Herod doesn't get out of line. Enemies. Because Herod didn't care for Pontius Pilate and Pontius Pilate didn't care for Herod. And yet this high time would have caused probably one of the worst uproars. And this is what they were trying to avoid. So all of this, everything was working against them. We have too many people here. We got to take them away by night. We do it under the cover of darkness. It won't draw too much attention. And all the while, they think they got this really good plan going on. But because of God's sovereignty, because of his word, because of the truth of his word, listen, guys, everything was going according to plan. Jesus was not caught off guard at all by anything. So as sneaky as the religious leaders were being, and even to the point where they did not even take him to uh, the place that is known the seat of the hewn stone, they didn't even take him there. They take him to Caiaphas' house. <laughs> they do the trial at the high priest's house, something you do not do. But everything begins to fall apart. Why? Because their schemes and their trickery, and I think this is important for us to understand, their schemes and their trickery was not what killed Jesus. God used their wickedness 
The father strikes the son using the evil intentions of the religious leaders and their actions, their sinful actions against Jesus. And the Lord, the father, strikes Jesus. And notice that we see here that this is what he does. So they really feel we got him, but ultimately Jesus is like, no, we got you. So now we see here in verse 53 that they led Jesus away to the high priest and with him were assembled all the chief priests. So they lead Jesus away, right? And then we also see here that there's a final verdict given by the Sanhedrin. And, and this is who's gathered here. All the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. All the chief priests, the elders and the scribes is none other than the Sanhedrin. You have the 70 member here of this, of this court, and, and, and their purpose is to punish Jesus by death. And notice what it says here, but Peter followed him at a distance. You know, you got to give Peter credit. He's still following him. Ultimately, he will do as Jesus said he would do, thus fulfilling Jesus' scripture when he says, all will stumble because of me. And even you, even though Peter said, I won't, they might, but I won't. Jesus says, especially you, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows a second time. But Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest and sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Now, I think there's a lot of application we can put here. There are some who follow Jesus at a distance and thus following Jesus at a distance, you will always warm yourself at the fire of his enemies. When you don't follow Jesus with a committed heart and faithfully seeking the Lord and living for him, listen, when you, when you follow Jesus and live for you, now, I know that sometimes, listen to this, guys. Sometimes we think of people who are uncommitted in the church. I'm not talking about uncommitted people. I'm talking about disciples like Peter. I'm talking about people in ministry, people serving the Lord. When we follow Jesus, where are we following him from? Because to be near Christ is to be Christ-like. There's no justification for your lack thereof, none whatsoever. And I think there's more that we're going to get. But there's a lot of applications. So the application there would be when we follow Jesus at a distance, we will always warm ourselves with his enemies. For Peter to warm himself there, guys, he just almost chopped a guy's head off. And now here he is <laughs> trying to get warm by the fire with Jesus' enemies. It says a lot about Peter, at least in the present situation that he's in. But this will come out. This will come back to, as we say, to bite Peter. Okay? Now look at verse 55. It says, Now the chief priest and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. So they accused Jesus. They sought counsel. The chief priests are saying, okay, we're going to condemn him to death. And so I, I just want you to think of the picture. They got him now. We got him. Under the cover of darkness, no riot was caused. Listen, for the most part, the only people that knew that Jesus was arrested was his disciples. That's it. Nobody else knew that Jesus was arrested. They went and found him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Nobody else was praying there at the Garden of Gethsemane. And the only other ones that knew that Jesus was arrested was this whole entourage. What did Jesus say about this entourage that came? Jesus answered and said in verse 48 to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. I love how Jesus just throws that in there. He says, boy, you guys really went big this time. 
But really, it's not you. The scriptures are going to be fulfilled. But here's the point. The only ones that knew of Jesus' arrest were these ones here, and they were trying to keep it under wrap. So they tried to come up with something. What? Okay, we got him. Now, now what, what do we really have on him? Well, the first accusation, if you will, or the first charge against Jesus, listen to this, as they're at the home of the high priest. So Jesus makes a faithful witness as to who he is. So they try to condemn him. And the first accusation, what does it say in verse 55? What are the last three words? But found none. First accusation, whatever they wanted to do, whatever they were trying to do, the religious leaders were saying, we don't really have nothing on him. We've arrested him. We got him now. But what do we get him for? I don't know. Do you know? No, I don't know. All I know is I don't like him. All I know is I hate him. Okay, so what else do we got? Okay, so look at verse 56. But many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. We might not have something, but, but listen, some of the other ones might. So let's, let's get some of them. Hey, you, you remember, weren't you upset with us? Yes, yes. And, and, and what was this? What, what were we mad at him about again? Ah, uh, let, me, let me see here. Let me think. You know, do you remember? Well, I, I kind of do. And you see that their, that their stories did not align. Their testimonies did not agree. Why is this important? Because it says, when it says their testimonies did not agree, in the original language, it means their testimonies were not consistent. They were not consistent. You need a consistent testimony. The Bible gives us an understanding on having a consistent testimony. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 19, it talks about there being two or three witnesses. We'll look at this a little bit later here. But we see here that there was a requirement by law for testimonies to agree. If a testimony could not agree, then guess what? The accusation fails. Second accusation fails right here. Verse 57 says, And some rose up and bore false witness against him. <laughs> when they seen that the religious leaders didn't have anything against him, and when they seen that others tried to put something together, listen, the law was not in their favor. The law was not in their favor. As a matter of fact, Look at what Deuteronomy 17 says concerning this. Deuteronomy 17. And it talks about, you know, what they're doing here. Look at what it says. It says, whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death. Listen to this. On the testimony of two or three witnesses, he shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. On the testimony of one. It, it, it doesn't work that way. Look at this in Deuteronomy 19, as I was stating earlier in verses 15 and 16, it says, one witness shall not rise against a man concerning an iniquity or any sin that he commits by the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. If a false witness rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing. Notice something here that you cannot bring up an accusation unless you have two or three witnesses. You know, Jesus actually used that against the religious leaders in one of the, because, you know, they, they hated Jesus. And, and, and I'm sure that they remembered that in the story of the adulterous woman in John chapter 8. And remember when the scribes and the Pharisees, they brought to him a woman caught in the act of adultery. Now, remember in Deuteronomy 22, in verse 22, it says, when a woman is caught in the act of adultery, it says that you bring both the man and the woman to be what? Stoned to death. So Jesus is teaching a sermon and the same religious leaders that arrested him want to use the same law against him that they're trying to use against him, but they want him to fumble at the law. And this woman was caught, and they set her in his midst. Can you imagine this woman caught in the very act? They took her just as they found her. And threw her in the midst of Jesus, and they said to him, Teacher, this woman is caught in adultery in the very act. And I love, look at what they say here. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, 
But what do you say? This is what they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger, he wrote in the ground as though he did not hear. Now, this whole picture of Jesus stooping down and and writing in the ground. You know, the Bible says, once again, to not bear false witness against your brother. But you know what's interesting is that prophecy in Jeremiah, that the names of those that forsake him shall be written in the earth. And what's interesting about this here is, I believe that this is what Jesus is fulfilling, the prophecy of Jeremiah. As he stoops down with his finger, it says it very clearly here, as though he did not hear them. So they continued asking him, raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone. And he stooped down again and wrote on the ground. And those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one with the oldest to the last. And Jesus was left alone. Now I love this here. Why? Because Jesus being left alone here they had nothing that they could bring, any accusation. And notice Jesus' response. And this is important that it says he was left alone. Jesus raised himself up and he saw no one but the woman. This is really important. He saw no one. He was left alone. This is really important here. Why? Because according to the law, there needed to be two or three witnesses. Now keep in mind, it's eyewitnesses. When Jesus raised himself up, he saw no one but the woman. And he said to her, woman, where are your accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. She's saying, according to Deuteronomy 19, there's no one here. And then he says, well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Because Jesus was not a witness of it. Jesus received an accusation against her. But Jesus was not a witness of it. This also can be applied to, you know, our lives as believers, as Christians. You know, we are called to live a certain life as as believers. And especially a lot of times we find ourselves, you know, having to practice such things. Notice what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is to the church and to the Christian. The same principle applies here. It says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask for a raise in my salary. But he also says in verse 19, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. You know, the problem today in the church is that there's no two or three witnesses. Accusations are made about people by gossip. That's it. An eyewitness is a person who is there that said, you know, and people will say things like, you know, they think they're being secluded from it or separated from the matter when they say, well, You know, we don't know whether they did or they didn't. You're just as bad. If you don't know, keep your mouth shut. And plus, if the person's not there, you shouldn't even be talking about them anyways. But if you know, if you're a witness because you've seen it, now, that is because you've heard or because you know that, then yeah, then you can go and you can say, hey, listen, this is what you said. This is why in Matthew 18, in church discipline, Jesus said, when you first go confront your brother, let them know. And hopefully you'll you'll win them over. But if not, take someone with you. Deuteronomy 19, why? Because if you go and tell them again, hey, I've already told you once, and, and now here we are again a second time, well, they can deny you came the first time, but the second time they can't because now you have your eyewitness that's there and saying, yes, you did tell them, and you told them to stop, and you told them not to do it. And by the third time around, if they don't do that, then he says, then you take them before the church and let everybody know what they're really like. And so in all of this, this all goes back to the same principle that's applied to this witness. Now, the witness that matters is the witness of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus gives a faithful witness as to who he is, but yet now we have false witnesses will fail. False witnesses will not only fail, but a false witness will find ways to lie no matter what the facts are. They're going to fail miserably, but boy, they are willing to lie no matter what the facts are. And, and look at what they do here. They're, they're really trying to condemn him. In verse 55, it says, what's the purpose to put him to death? Well, I just read to you what Deuteronomy 17 says about trying to put someone to death. So it says here that some rose up and we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands and within three days I will build another made without hands. That's not what Jesus said. They're lying now. <laughs> and, and, and they're making this. Now here's the third accusation and guess what? It says in verse 59, but not even then did their testimony agree. Why? Because it's not true. It's a lie. So the first accusation, gone. Second accusation, gone. Third accusation, gone. Three strikes, you're out, man. So let me put it to you this way. Why are we highlighting these accusations and their failure? Because I want you to understand that Jesus' death at Calvary's cross was an act of the Father. All that Scripture might be fulfilled. Man will attempt to think that he has his hand in God's will. And like Jesus rebuked Peter in the past when he had spoke concerning his death, what did he say? Far be it from me, this will not happen to you. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. In other words, the only person who would disagree with the death of, death of Christ is Satan. The only one who would try to get in the way of it would be Satan himself. And now we see here these false witnesses, guys, lie, no matter what the facts are. Jesus never said that. Jesus was talking about his, himself, his body. He was not talking about the temple because to reproach the temple was punishable. But they were finding ways to put him to death. Jesus was not talking about the temple there. He was talking about himself and he was talking about what he would soon face. But because they had no desire to be near him, listen to this, they didn't know him. And even the ones who were near would reject him, Judas being one, even one who was near, so zealous. See, sometimes we think that zealous, oh man, look at, they're on fire and this and that. And, 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 we, and we say this to people in a way that, that I think sometimes we shouldn't. When we say, oh, look at, you know, I, you know, I love your passion. I love your zeal. There's only one passion. It's the passion of Christ. And to say and to highlight somebody's passion or highlight somebody's zeal is you're exalting a man. And the Bible says that we're to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. And in due time, he exalts us. Jesus says, beware of the praises of men. In some way, how is that praise of man encouraging that person's faith? Humility before the Lord and a realization that it is the will of the Father that should be played out and lived out more than anything will always shape us and mold us into the position that we need to be in. Can I tell you guys there's only one position for the child of God? You ready for it? Jot it down, capital letters, put it in your notes. It's the lowly position. Listen to this. The lowly position. What did Jesus say? This is what Jesus said about the lowly position. In the same chapter... In verse 9, Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Did Jesus ever tell us that? No. 
Our faith, our commitment to Jesus is a response to his word. Listen to this. The high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? Remember what Jesus said. Verse 49. The scriptures must be what? Let me read to you what the Bible says in Isaiah 53. Look at what it says in Isaiah 53. In verse 7, I'm going to read it to you. Just jot it down in your notes. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. What did Jesus say? So that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Do you not answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silence, silenced and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Now, this response here is going to be Jesus' claim to deity. But, but notice the point that they're asking. They're asking a couple of things. Are you the Christ? And then they say here, the son of the blessed, the term of the blessed. The blessed one is none other than God. And they're asking him, are you the son of God? Remember, to say that you are the son of God is to say that you were equal to your father. Thus declaring that you are God. To say that he is the son of God, he's claiming deity. Now think about this response here that Jesus makes. It's pretty interesting. Jesus gives a solid confession. I think this is really important here. Jesus gives a solid confession. So notice what it says. Jesus said, I am. That was Jesus' statement, I am. And Jesus said, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power. The term here, the power, is another reference to God. And coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, Jesus is tying together the Son of Man who is approaching the Ancient of Days in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 and also tying in Deity from Psalm 110 in verse 1. You could also see Psalm chapter 2 there. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am both God and Messiah. Boy, that's pretty powerful, right? Now, what I think is interesting here is Jesus is saying, that I am both your Messiah and your coming judge. Wow. <laughs> Jesus' solid statement comes from the very fact that Jesus himself is the rock of our salvation. What did Paul the Apostle say in 1 Corinthians in chapter 10? Paul's words to the believers at Corinth, he says this concerning Jesus. Giving these Old Testament examples, he says in chapter 10 in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians, he says, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. The Bible says that Jesus is the rock of our salvation. It reminds us of who Jesus is. And we have to understand that Jesus speaks concerning this rock, concerning himself as well. Remember, Jesus gave this parable. And Jesus talked about being this rock. And he warned, he says, listen, if this rock falls on you, it will what? Crush you. 
Rather, Jesus says, fall upon this rock so that you can be broken rather than the rock falling upon you so that it breaks you, crushes you, and destroys you. And in all of this, Jesus was speaking concerning himself. What we see here also that Paul even goes on to say here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he, he even takes it a step further and, and he gives them further understanding. He says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Well, the only way you and I can fall is if the rock becomes a rock of stumbling and offense to us. But what we see here is that Jesus' solid statement is made in that Jesus is that very thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in verse 11 clearly says that Jesus is the foundation upon which the church is on. Acts chapter 4 verse 11 says that he is the chief cornerstone. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 speaks concerning the foundation that is Christ in Christ alone. Remember what Peter says in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, in verses 6 through 8? That not only is Christ the chief cornerstone, but Peter even goes on to say that we are living stones being fitted together. How do we become these stones? Being fitted together because the chief cornerstone. And if we need any further encouragement of Isaiah 28... The prophet Isaiah speaks concerning this very truth, too, about Jesus. This is a, a prophecy concerning Jesus fulfilled in the person and work of Christ. But notice what it says here. He says in Isaiah chapter 28, Therefore, thus says the Lord, verse 16, the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. And this is what Paul the Apostle used in Romans chapter 9. He tried to encourage the believers in Rome and tell them, hey, listen, this is who we stand upon. Our faith is in Christ. Christ is our solid rock, the rock of our salvation. What does this mean? Jesus is the foundation upon which we stand on that will not break. Jesus also is solid. The statement concerning Christ is praiseworthy. Jesus alone and nothing else compares to who God has made to be that rock, that solid rock. Romans chapter 9 Notice what the Bible says here in verse 33. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And notice in chapter 10 of Romans in verse 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now, I think this is really important. Why? Because it gives us the solidarity and understanding of Jesus' statement. Jesus is clearly stating here that he is none other than God. You might say, well, how do you know that for sure? Look at verse 63. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need do we have of witnesses? There's no need now to bring witnesses against him. This came out of his own mouth. You have heard the blasphemy claiming to be God. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Notice how he rips his garment. This is a sign of mourning. He is their judge and he is their Messiah. Then some began to spit on him. This act of insult, if you've never been spat on in Thankfully, you probably haven't, but anybody that has, you know the degrading humility. The Bible says in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 14 and Deuteronomy 25, 9, this is an act of insult. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 10. They blindfolded him. They beat him. And say to him, prophesy. You know, this is 
a very hard text to work through. But I think sometimes the church today reads this verse in verse 65 and, and, and they don't really take into consideration that it gets far worse than this. It's funny how today we can sit in a Bible study like tonight and we take no offense to Jesus being spit upon. Oh, but if somebody spits on you tonight, boy, you'll go out of your way to let everybody know. Because you being spat upon is more important than Jesus who was spit on for you and degraded for you. You see, Jesus facing the religious leaders was spit upon. They covered his eyes. They beat him. The Bible says in Matthew's gospel, they took a rod and they were hitting him on top of his head with it. Put a crown of thorns on him. You know, they did all this. They, 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 they flogged him. They, they did everything up until he went to the cross as they crucified him. But this is the start of it here. It gets worse. It gets far worse. But in all of this, and they say, prophesy. They mocked him. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 24. And the officer struck him with the palm of their hands. In other words, they received him with slaps. They were slapping Jesus. And ultimately, Jesus was innocent. Remember, when we just read Isaiah 53 and verse 7, he was innocent. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6. Remember what was said of Jesus in the book of Acts? This is Jesus whom they spit upon. This is Jesus whom they slapped around. This is Jesus whom they said as they struck him and he was blindfolded, prophesied to us, tell us who hit you. The Bible says this in Acts chapter 10. In verse 8, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, listen to this, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. That's all Jesus did. He did good and he healed all who were oppressed by the devil. And ultimately, this here would lead Jesus to free man from the bondage of their sin because this would lead to Jesus' crucifixion. Here's another thought. All the commotion within the courtyard of the high priest and the house of Caiaphas, all of this commotion there, guys, listen to this. Peter is watching all of this. We don't see Peter weeping as Jesus is getting hit. We don't see Peter weeping bitterly as Jesus is being spit upon. We don't see Peter weeping at all whatsoever as any of this is taking place as the other Gospels say that Jesus was even slapped in the face. Remember that? Peter's not weeping. Jesus makes a faithful witness. Here we see an example of a faithful witness. Now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest now, I think this is interesting. Perhaps, you know, Peter followed out of concern for Jesus or his fidelity to him. But, but remember, Peter made a vow. And what was his vow? That he would what? Peter said, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will what? I will not be stumbled. Have any of you ever made a vow? You ever made a vow to God? You ever made an oath to the Lord? You know, the Bible speaks quite a bit. There's about 30 biblical references to vows. And ultimately, what the Bible says about vows, it says it's better for you not to make a vow and not keep it. It's better to just don't even vow. And I think sometimes people think that vows are like promises you make to God, but, but vows are commitments you make even to others. And I've seen more vows broken in the church 
than I ever have seen. Because vows are made, in a sense, foolishly. And, and, and these vows come in the church, I'll put it to you this way. If there's anybody that has ever had vows made to them more than anybody, it's the pastor of the church. Things like, Pastor, I promise. Pastor, I will. Pastor, the Lord's called me here to do. Pastor, all of these things. You're making vows. They sound good. It's encouraging. But I've learned early on not to believe people's words. No matter how good they make themselves look, and even if they speak those vows in the King James, be very careful. Because most likely they're not going to keep those vows. And then they, will, then they will mix these vows up and change them any way they want because they were foolish vows. They were rash vows. And you want to know what? Here's the point that I will say. When I made vows to the church, my vow was to teach the Bible faithfully, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, whether it's a thousand people or one person. And I've set my heart to do so. I set my heart to do that, to keep those vows or that vow specifically before the Lord. And, and to teach faithfully. Now, there are vows that I won't make because I know most likely I probably won't keep it. So I don't make the vow. There's things I say to the Lord and, 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 and things that I've prayed to the Lord and there are commitments I've made to God and I keep those things. Sometimes people don't keep vows because of sin and they think that, oh, well, you know, I sinned and I blew it. No, you repent from your sin and you continue to keep the vow that you made to the Lord. It might take a little bit longer because maybe there's a process of restoration depending on the sin, whatever the case might be. But if you made a vow and especially, listen, for those of you that are sitting here tonight and those that are watching in this broadcast, here, here is a great opportunity for you to think back and think of the maybe the commitments you've made to leaders in this church or other brothers and sisters in this church or to me or to the Lord as you were here. Listen, and if you faltered and if you failed, you can't blame Pastor Dave or the leaders or anybody else because things didn't work out your way. You still made a vow. You still have to keep it. What you need to re do is repent. And you keep that vow. And you honor the Lord. Vows are not made because it's comfortable. Vows are not made because you're gaining something from it. Vows are never made. This is why a lot of times we always tell people, hold on, relax, and people get upset with us. They're like, oh, well, they don't, they don't want me here. They don't want me a part of it. No, we just don't want you not to keep that vow because it requires more than just accomplishing something. A vow is not, hey, I'm going to take you out to lunch after service. And then you go and you just take them out to lunch. There's, there should be a meaning behind that. What's the purpose? Just to fill their stomach? No, the reason why you're probably going to go to lunch is because you desire a relationship with that person. You desire to pour into them and disciple them. That's not something you do over one meal. When you make a vow to someone, it's making a commitment, especially here. And, you know, I'll be the first to tell you guys, I'm not saying I'm perfect. But I, God, God has always dealt with my heart in the area of commitment. And I will say this with all sincerity of heart. I'm the first one to tell you that I'm not the perfect person in the area of commitment and God has dealt with my heart. But I'll tell you, I see less commitment, more vows made that are not kept in this fellowship as a pastor than not. And I'm afraid there are too many Peters that are just following Jesus at a distance. And there's too many people playing the role on their part, playing the victim as if they're more important than Jesus and the gospel and the sake of the ministry. And there's more people concerned with their circumstances and situations than concerned with the gospel, that there's people that still need to be saved and discipled. There are people that want to go and do great things for the kingdom, and they haven't even impacted the community or even the fellowship that God brought them in. Because when you're building your own kingdom... The community and the fellowship that Christ has brought you to means nothing to you. That's following Jesus at a distance. That's warming yourself with the affections of your flesh and the things that gratify you. I'll, I'll take it a step further. We make rash vows like Jephthah did 
in the book of Judges. And what did he say? Lord, you give me this victory. Lord, you give me this victory and I'll give you the first thing that walks out of my house. God gave him the victory. His daughter came walking out of the house. And as he went before the Lord, the Bible says Jephthah kept his vow. It doesn't say what he did or how far he went, but he said, it says that he kept his vow. And I would say that Jephthah did not sacrifice his daughter in giving up her life, but he did sacrifice his daughter to the Lord. Because she said, let me go and mourn. And what did she mourn? That she would never marry. She didn't mourn that she was about to die. So I know she was not sacrificed to death. What a foolish vow. What did Jephthah miss out on? Being a grandpa. Having a great lineage and heritage. And you want to know what? That's what you will miss out on when you make vows that you cannot keep or you make foolish and rash vows that you don't realize what you're saying. Jesus said, count the cost. Count the cost. Christianity is not a game. It's not a club. It's not a click. It's not a drawing attention to oneself. It's exalting Jesus Christ, who's our Savior, the one who was spit upon for you, the one who was slapped and beat and crucified for you. Where, where do we make this about us? Where, where do we make this about who we like and who we don't like and, 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 and that, that, that it's about, you know, what we got going on versus, listen, if, if, if we as a body here would be more united on winning Fontana for Jesus, we would be struggling to keep this place open because it would just be too many people coming. But what are we united on? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Have I united my heart with the ministry? Listen, everything I'm sharing tonight is found, I believe, just in this story with Peter. Peter made a vow he couldn't keep. How often do we make vows we don't keep? And listen, God didn't call me. One of the fruits of the Spirit is being a vow finder, okay? God didn't call me to be a vow finder. But listen, I can name a lot of times people made commitments to me, even people sitting in this study tonight and have not kept them. But I'm not Jesus. You don't worship me. That's why I don't do that. But God will hold you accountable to it. So that's why, what do we do? You say, oh, wow, yeah, that's true. Listen, you know. You know what you've done. Peter knew very well what he was doing here. Thank God that Peter's story doesn't end with making a vow he couldn't keep. Because Jesus vowed to die for our sins and he kept it. Peter was able to be restored, even his vow be renewed. And Peter repented, and guess what he did? He lived the rest of his life keeping that vow to the Lord his God. But we have to be told the reality. You have to be told. I have to be told. You're in sin. Even further, you're a liar. You lie. You can't be trusted. And if you lie in these little things, I can only imagine what other things you're lying in and what you're lying in outside and what you're lying in at work and what you're lying in among people. And it might not even be in word. It could be in thought. It could be in action. Whatever the case might be, we are all sinners in need of a savior. and Nobody's been perfected. And daily we have to, what do we do? Throw ourselves on the rock of our salvation so that we can be broken. That when we say things, Jesus said, let your yes be a, yes. and your nay a nay. Jesus is not talking about, hey, if you say something, accomplish it. No, Jesus is saying, live your life in such a way that when you tell someone yes, they never doubt your yes. When we said yes to Jesus, how many of you here said yes to Jesus? Have you kept that vow to him? Oh, yeah, I'm here. Hmm. Let's be real, church. Do you not want God's word to increase your faith and correct you? Yes or no? This is the road we got to walk through. Look at what he did. Peter saw, she saw Peter warming himself. She looked at him and she said, you were also with Jesus of Nazareth. Wow. But he denied it. Saying, I neither know nor understand what you were saying. And he went out on the porch and a rooster crowed. Wow. 
some will say of Jesus, I don't know what you're talking about. That's what Jesus said to her. I neither know nor understand what you are saying. Sometimes we say that because going back to a vow that we made, we couldn't keep. We go because we're following Jesus at a distance. We're not solid like Jesus. We don't have a solid rock faith like Christ. Listen, guys, there's somewhere Peter's life is, is a lesson that we can learn from. Some will say, I don't know what you're talking about. They have no desire to face or perhaps Peter even looking and saying, I don't think I can take being spit upon in my face and smacked around like Jesus. I don't know what you're talking about. Jesus or excuse me, Peter follows Jesus at a distance, warms himself at the fire of Jesus' enemies, and even more so we see here Peter distancing himself further and further. Can I tell you guys, the further you walk away from Jesus, the worse it gets. He went out on his porch. He went out on the porch and, and the rooster crowed. Listen to this. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, this is one of them. But he denied it again. And look at what he said. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. So Peter denies Jesus again, and some will say of Jesus, I don't belong to him. She said, this is one of them. This is the one that belongs to him. And what did he do? Verse 70, he denied it again. Some will say, I don't belong. I don't belong to him. And then they say, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilee and your speech shows it. Your speech betrays you, some translations say. Talk about being betrayed and found out. Listen to this, guys. Verse 71, then he began to curse and swear and say, I do not know this man of whom you speak. You see the word here, curse? I, it, it, it behooves me when people say that Peter started cussing and using foul language. If you ever heard that, stop listening to that preacher because they're lying to you. You know what Peter did here? He began to curse. What did he say? Peter invoked a curse upon himself. You know what Peter said? Damn be me if I know the man. Talk about the greatest act of denial. The Bible says in Luke chapter 22 and verse 61, listen to this, that Jesus looked at Peter the moment he said that as he denied him for the third time. What did Jesus look at Peter for? I think that Jesus' gaze to Peter was not to say, I told you you would do this, and or how could you? I believe that Jesus' look to Peter was love. Some will say of Jesus, I don't know him. They will deny him. I want to read something to you guys that I think is going to help you why I think this is important. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter. Peter, who just denied Jesus. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonas, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Peter confessed Jesus as Messiah. 
And she's saying, you're one of his. No, I'm not. Your speech betrays you. You talk like one of them. I told you I don't know him. You got to be one of his disciples. Peter says, damn me. By God, if I know the man. He confessed him as Messiah. The rock of our salvation becomes a firm foundation for believers, but a rock of crushing for rejectors. Look at what Jesus says here to Peter once again. Jesus answered and said, blessed are you. <laughs> Peter doesn't feel blessed at this moment. Simon bar Jonas, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. I think Simon bar Jonas is Peter's past. Bar meaning son, son of Jonah. In other words, Jesus is saying Simon, son of Jonah. Jesus could have easily called Simon Jonah and everybody would have known who he was talking about. Just like when Jesus said, I am the son of God, he's claiming to be what? God, equal to his father. Peter's name is equal to his father. And Jesus changes his name in verse 18. I say to you that you are Peter, not Simon bar Jonas. Now you're Peter. The word Jonas in the original language, the word, the root word actually is Yaim in the Hebrew language. We know the word Yonah means dove, but Yaim has the root word in it that means wine. And in the wine, you have the fragments of, you know, grapes and seeds and stuff like that. And so it also has the idea of murky water with sand in it. Jesus changes Peter's name from sifting sand to Petros. Peter means small rock. Jesus says, you are now Peter, you are a rock. And on this rock, what rock? He uses the Greek word Petra, not Petros, means massive stone. What was the massive stone? Peter's statement, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. This is why Peter and all them, and Paul later on, and all them proclaim that Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He is the foundation upon which the church is built on. We are all just little pebbles. And guess what? Peter, as a pebble, under pressure, crumbled. Will you crumble under pressure of commitment, fidelity to Christ, faithfulness, or faced with sin? How about your own desires in your flesh? Do you crumble? Or is Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God? Jesus can be, as the world says, anything you want him to be. The scriptures say Jesus is only one thing and one thing alone. He is the rock of our salvation. He is the Savior. And the Bible says here a second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to the mind the word that Jesus had said to him before the rooster crows twice. You will deny me three times. Listen to this. And he went. When he thought about it, he wept. Why did Peter weep? Because he was Peter. And upon the rock that he was supposed to stand upon, he didn't. He crumbled under pressure. He made a vow he couldn't keep. He denied that he didn't even know Jesus. He denied that he didn't belong to Jesus. And he went on to say, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't belong to him and I don't know him but yet you confess that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. Well, I love that the story with Peter doesn't end there. This part where it says he wept. It's the same thing Jesus did in John chapter 11. And a miracle took place. That little sifting sand of Peter now has become a rock and though this rock began to crumble, ultimately we see that the rock is restored because the rock of his salvation is Jesus. When I looked at this, I asked myself several questions. David, in what areas are you like Peter? My answer to myself was, 
in a lot of ways. As we say, at times we are on and at times we are off. But ultimately, Jesus never is. He's the solid rock of our salvation. He's the foundation we can come. And listen to this, guys. Maybe some of you tonight need to throw yourself on the rock of your salvation so that you can be broken. So that you can come to that place and say, you know what, Lord? I need to, I need to walk away spiritually weeping from this, realizing, man, Lord, that was a heavy word. It should have been. Because rocks are heavy. Are they not? And Jesus warned the religious leaders. He says, listen, if you reject this rock, all it's going to do is crush you. But if you throw yourself upon this rock, it'll break you. And there's a foundation upon which you can rest. It's Jesus. Looking at Peter's denial from this perspective teaches us a lot about ourselves. We love to talk about Jesus being denied by Peter or Peter denying Jesus. We love to talk about that story, but we never love to talk about when we do it. That story was there for us not to put Peter in that place. It's to put us in that place and take inventory of our heart and ask ourselves, are we being a Peter? Like with God's word, the sword, and just chopping ears off. Being proud and arrogant claiming to know the scriptures, yet being so zealous in our pride that, that we overlook what the Bible says and we forget the vows that we made. And, and when faced with oppression and opposition, the Bible says Jesus was oppressed, but what did he do? He didn't open his mouth. Peter opens his mouth and says, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't belong to him. And then he says, I don't know him. God damned me, if I know him, is what Peter said. See, we don't realize that Christianity is not about us. It's about him. When you let the word of God sit within your heart, you begin to realize, what am I doing? That's the problem. What are you doing? Christianity doesn't need your help. It needs your heart. It doesn't need your wisdom. It needs all of you so that Jesus is glorified and exalted. Amen? And when we face the oppression and the trials of life, when we face those things, listen, we don't crumble. We stand upon the solid rock of our salvation. Let's pray. Father.